Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Framerate is brought to you by Shutterstock.com. With over 1 million high-quality video clips, Shutterstock helps you take your creative projects to the next level. For 30% off your new account, go to Shutterstock.com and use offer code FRAMERATE6. King's Landing and take your rightful seat on my iron throne. Go for it. Why the f*** are you Rocky? You said you were gonna be Drago. Drogo! Call Drogo! You're supposed to be my Khaleesi! Wait, did you think I'm an Ivan Drago? You're a bum, Rock. Not now, Tim Tom. <sighs> It's frame rate, episode 126, the saddest frame rate yet. I'm Tom Merritt. Says you, today's the delightful day. Enjoy the sunshine, Tom. Carpe diem, I say. I'm Brian Brushwood. Joining us today and still crying <laughs> is Justin Robert Young. Oh, good God. Oh, so much emotion. I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm all over the place. I'm all over the map. <laughs> <laughs> uh, big day in watching things, uh, and we will get to that uh, soon in, uh, in in regards to Game of Thrones. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about Arrested Development in, in the big stories, and of course, uh, the Venture Brothers, which you heard a little clip from there at the beginning of the show. But let's start with the big story. This just in, the big story. Robert, Robert in the chat room apparently thought I sounded like NPR. <laughs> Welcome back. Apparently to NPR all- is like sad all the time. They're just like, <laughs> you know, stocks were up today. Just, I guess that matters. But humanity well, is They're not despondent on NPR. They're professional. Yeah, that's... <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> tomato, tomato. <laughs> Let's say the big story is not NPR. The big story is that uh, the bidding continues... The rumors continue to fly. And, of course, we didn't have a show last week because of the Memorial Day holiday in the United States. So we missed Yahoo coming into the race and becoming a a big rumored bidder. A lot of people talking about them wanting to buy Hulu. But the more recent one over the weekend, I think it was on Friday, actually, DirecTV, apparently, according to the Wall Street Journal and Reuters, have bid $1 billion dollars. For Hulu, and one other of the purported bidders has bid a billion, but Reuters didn't know who it was. And don't forget, besides Yahoo, there's also uh, Time Warner, uh, Peter Chernin, the Guggenheim Group, uh, and I believe there's another investment group in the mix there, too. Yeah, now uh, keep in mind, there were two other bidders that offered $1 billion, according no, to the. There were the, two, two the other bidders besides yeah, so DirecTV. Three, yes, thank you. Right, okay, right. So, so we do have a, a bit of a bidding war happening. Now, if you're going to pick, I mean, not that it matters, not that, that any of, I mean, this is all rampant speculation, but is there a particular home you think that Hulu belongs with? Well, Boy, I, you know, Justin, do you, do you have an opinion on this? Because I keep going back and forth, frankly. I mean, I, I think it's, a, it's an impossible question because, A, we don't know what where, when they have a new home, what they want to do with it, and B, we don't know what it's going to be. Because I think a billion dollars seems a little low for something that has the growth potential that Hulu does as IPTV becomes more of a reality for how people get their entertainment. I mean, Yeah, but it's the uncertainty, Justin. That's you don't, it. It's great if you get the deals that you have now, but as soon as News Corp and Disney are out of there... They're going to have a hard time getting all of those shows back onto Hulu. Absolutely. I mean, and, and you just nailed it, Tom. The problem is, is that what you're buying is the chassis. You don't get any of the innards guaranteed. Those are all the deals that, that, that come with it. And so it's like as much as I'd like to see a disruptive entity like, like Yahoo come in, uh, part of me w- wouldn't mind seeing like a direct TV take it over because at least they have inroads with all of these other companies, all these other networks in order to possibly secure these same level of deals that maybe even better ones. I think if a Peter Chernin or a Guggenheim gets it, that's probably the least 
changing that happens with Hulu. I think they continue to operate it the way it is, and they're the ones that have to get long-term deals out of the former owners. I think if Yahoo comes in, you'll see Hulu do more free stuff. I think Yahoo uses Hulu to expand their video, and Yahoo can bring in sales. They sell video, and they make original web video right now, so that's a big advantage for them. I think if Time Warner or DirecTV buys it, you see Hulu start to become the TV everywhere pass. The thing that says, hey, sign up for Hulu and then you can get access to all of the great programming from either Time Warner or DirecTV uh, as, as sort of a, a Trojan horse for Internet cable. Now, in, in that particular breakdown, you would say Yahoo really wants Hulu if even just for the fact that they already have a built in subscriber base. They are dealing with people who are paying money for content. So now Hulu uh, or, or Yahoo can just say, OK, well, now the content's different, but here's the deal. Now we're like Netflix. We are in the original programming game and they've already, you know, signed a bunch of deals to have that be the slate that people want to pay for. And now they would already have a relationship with people who have given their credit card information. That's a, that's a good point. And speaking of original content, that is another big story. <laughs> Stop everything. It's another big story. Netflix's Arrested Development premiered over the Memorial Day weekend. Uh, illegally downloaded 100,000 times, which means it's popular, and also watched a lot. Uh, Netflix is kind of cagey with these sorts of, of numbers, but people looking at the traffic out there and kind of trying to spy on it and see who was using Netflix say that this was definitely outdoing House of Cards in the number of people watching it. Now, do you think it's possible to maybe take a educated guess at how many downloads were performed on Netflix based on the amount of piracy happening? For example, Game of Thrones racks up, uh, what, a million downloads, probably not in the same amount of time. But uh, like I would, I would love to use piracy numbers, which appear to be in the open, as a proxy to guess at. Uh, the statistical likelihood of what the actual download numbers are since K uh, Netflix is being cagey about yeah, that. Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit difficult because Netflix is a different animal than HBO as far as you know viewership and the ability to watch all of the Arrested Developments at once changes the game versus HBO where you can do everything on HBO Go that's been released up till then. Uh, right. But, but as a rough proxy, that makes Arrested Development a tenth the size of yeah, but keep in mind also, I uh, I don't know if they, that that one million downloads uh, illegally of Game of Thrones it doesn't give a time zone on that. So if that was I don't uh, was that a million downloads I, in the first twenty four hours? I don't know if that was in the first twenty four hours or, or not. Yeah. So I, I thought that was in the first month. So well, here's here's the interesting thing about that Netflix number problem is they really do have a growing issue on their hands. You saw their stock get knocked down when Arrested Development got released, and some of the critics really hammered it. Uh, it that was. Not how Netflix wants their original programming to be received critically. I don't think they care about it so much about the Eli Roth series, but they certainly were counting on more of a positive critical reaction for Arrested Development. And because there is an absence of data, they are getting pushed around when things like that happen. I, yeah. I, I think, and I would curious to see whether you guys think that this is realistic, that they have always said the year mark. That's what we're looking. We're looking to compare our original programming to other programming a year into when it is released. If we are, I would think, it's not reasonable to think that with House of Cards, since it was an unqualified success by any measure, that they might leak numbers, maybe not directly from them, but they might leak numbers to a favorable press outlet that will demonstrate that it is done well compared to other programming that is already on Netflix that might be traditionally broadcast. No, I, th I think you absolutely nailed it because uh, they, they did mention that, that they were able to, I, I think the only numbers that we saw were a week over week growth in uh, in in gross download numbers, but of course, you know, their numbers, numbers on a, not download numbers, right? Yeah, yeah sorry, sorry, streaming okay. numbers, right? Uh, but 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 as a, a percentage of bandwidth, but I I like what where Justin's headed with this in the absence of some kind of hard metric to measure success. You know, all of a sudden, stockholders are having to go to the critical response of the thing to get any kind of feel on whether or not, well, is this good or is it bad? Should we be happy well, that, or upset? In my opinion, that's just stupid short-term thinking on the part of stockholders. Like, what Netflix is going to judge, rightly so, is number of subscribers. If the yeah. subscriber number continues to go up, then the shareholders are going to want to keep owning stock. So getting all twi twitchy with your trigger finger because Arrested Development didn't get critical response is a little bit crazy short-term 
long-term thinking. However, no, no, look, no, what, nobody's arguing Netflix that the stockholders about, are smart. Let me finish this point. What Netflix sure. is worried about is that Arrested Development is supposed to bring in this huge subculture of people who love it to or to Netflix who might not already be subscribers. If the critics pan it, they might not bother to even try signing up for the 30-day free trial. Although I, I can tell you reasons why this is not, I mean, Netflix would justifiably be a little upset by the fact that people are taking these reviews. Because number one, critics are, are notoriously annoyed when they are not catered to. Netflix did not make the full season available to them before it was released. They had to watch it at midnight like everybody else and write their reviews about it. And number Good. two, it was... I'll tell you what, I love Arrested Development. The first couple episodes, we can get into what our thoughts about it were. But the most unfavorable I felt about the show was when I first started watching it. And the further yes. I've gotten away from it, the more I've enjoyed it. Yeah, no, yeah I, it, do we want to save that for what we're watching or do we want to talk about our opinions of the actual series now? Uh, let's let's save it. Well, let's, let's save it for what we're watching then. Okay, then I, I want to talk about... Netflix's original series approach because they're talking about rolling out 16 original shows, including stand up comedy specials, next year. And they say they want to spend 15% of their cash on originals. They want to double the number of titles in the next 18 months. I'll tell you months. what, uh, this is, you know, Netflix has said previously that they plan to essentially play right out of HBO's playbook. And the going with comedy specials is is straight out of HBO's playbook, but it's a double win because we're entering this phase right now where ever since the Louis C.K. experiment, people are realizing like, wow, I have a, you know, it's cheap and easy to produce my own stand-up specials. All I got to do is front like maybe, you know, six figures to make it happen. Then I own it outright. And I can score whatever kind of deal I want. Netflix is in the perfect situation where they don't have the overhead of an HBO and they could go to all of these top tier comedians and say, hey, you know, you want to make a special, you know, you want to own it. We want to let you own it. Uh, we want we just want to be able to distribute it for you. So it uh, I think this is a very smart move on Netflix's part. Well, it's also kind of a golden age for stand up comedians. We haven't really seen this since the 90s when uh, there was the sitcom boom. But uh, you are seeing, because of things like podcasting and new media and Twitter, you are seeing a rise of a certain brand of stand-up comedy from Mark Maron to Louis C.K. Uh, Amy Schumer's uh, Comedy Central show has done monster ratings. Uh, so it is really a good time for them to be into it. Somebody in the chat room pointed out, and that's correct, that uh, this is not new for them. They produced uh, the Zach Galifianakis Purple Onion uh, stand-up special a little while ago that was very, very funny. So uh, it's it's good for them. And I think, Tom, the fact that they are putting more money into it and they're doubling down on original programming uh, is the sign that internally they are happy with the numbers that they've seen so far on House of Cards, the Eli Roth werewolf spectacular and the rest of the development. All right, let's take a look at yet another big story. Tuck in your bootstraps. It's yet another big story. This one broke right before the Memorial Day weekend, so it's a little old, but the Microsoft Xbox One was unveiled. Brian and I were on the live stream right here on Twitch talking about it, uh, and they really made a play for the cord cutter in this announcement because they're going to have the E3 announcement to make a play for the gamer coming up June 10th. Uh, and this one was all about, hey, Steven Spielberg is going to do an original Halo show that's going to be available exclusively on Xbox, and we're going to be the one, the Xbox One is the name of the box, for you to watch TV, whether it's by HDMI pass-through or that hidden IR blaster port on the back. You will be able to see all of your TV shows shows whether it's cable or netflix or hulu or on demand as long as you're an xbox live subscriber yeah dude watching the announcement i was thrilled to see that they took the the gamers for granted they're like look we're going to be at e3 you guys are going to get all your numbers and specs and all your original titles and all your exclusives we're going to get to all that but for right now let us speak over your heads to the people who uh, who we want to expand out into uh this uh, this this in many ways was exactly what I wanted to hear. And I was totally elated that at least they were saying the right things. But then uh, one of the stories you put in here was, uh, uh, what was it? Um, the uh, uh, learns uh, Microsoft learns nothing from Google TV's mistakes on The Verge, where it just crushes the fact that, uh, that there's no built-in DVR, there's no access to control the DVR except for very limited uh, ability. You have to have partnerships with all that, so it's not going to be one box to rule them all. Mentions the IR blaster that we talked about. IR blaster is an, a, a very kludgy way 
to to uh, handle this kind of stuff. You uh, you can have a missed digit, and all of a sudden stuff doesn't get recorded. It looked to me all of the demos was all just for live television. And I don't know about you, but outside of sports, just there is no live television in my life. It does not exist. I never ever on purpose watch live television. Even Game of Thrones, I always come in like thirty minutes late because it starts just you know before the kids are quite to bed. Ah. So uh, the fact the fact that there's what we want is a box we could talk to, to to get it to get what we want immediately. And the fact that so much of what we want is not available real time kind of throws a red flag on this. So I don't know. I, I mean, of course, details are coming out soon. What, but, but you sounded like you have something, Justin. Brian, number one, sports. Put a pin in that because I'm very excited that you guys didn't have a show last week and I am on the show this week because I can unveil my grand conspiracy theory on the record. Uh, I think that original, original, original. All these, the Google uh, TV functionality and stuff, that is stuff that they want in there because they just want people to be able to say, hey, I can do more stuff with it with these infrastructure I have now. But the future for Microsoft is them doing the Halo series. More original content, the same way the Netflix is doing. There's a reason why they trotted out a big gun there. Although, if you actually look at Steven Spielberg's television credits, I don't know why you should be all that excited because he's done very poor stuff on television. But my big conspiracy theory, the N. FL. They had a big thing as part of the, uh, that they wanted to be integrated with them in terms of watching live games and having to be a different experience through your Xbox One. The NFL Sunday ticket package. The contract is up next year with DirecTV. DirecTV has used the NFL as a prime mover to get new subscribers onto their technology based on the fact that the NFL has only become more popular over the 10 or 15 years that they've had that package and people have been forced to get satellites. I believe that Microsoft will be a player for that contract and will make a huge play to say, hey, listen, you want to watch every single NFL game? Buy an Xbox One, buy a, an Xbox Live subscription service, and that will be the thing that we talk about come next year when it comes to this cord cutter or never cord having kind of communities relevance with Xbox One. First, and that first brings all, me right into my theory on what's going on with Xbox One, which is they know that the people who are going to buy this are still going to be video gamers. They know that, but they want to start training them to use it for other things because they also know that a game console's lifetime is around 10 years. And all of the hangups, Brian, that you mentioned are software-oriented hangups. Those are fixable. They could launch a Microsoft television service on the Xbox One down the road. They could launch a partnership with cable companies to deliver internet television. They could put a DVR in the Xbox. They have a terabyte hard drive in there for a reason. So all of these things are fixable. I think what Microsoft's doing is saying, given the state of what we can achieve today, let's put it out there and get people used to the idea. Then we make our partnership with the NFL. Then we come up with our internet television streaming plan that goes around the cable box so you don't have to do HDMI pass through. I would look for Microsoft to try to achieve those things within the next five years. Okay, just real quick though, what is different about being told these things this time versus back when uh, Google TV told us the exact same thing or web TV 10 years ago? Microsoft has those relationships and can do it competently. Google has never had those relationships. And if you remember, you know, Google within uh, either at the first Google TV demo to people, uh, uh, to uh, industry people, like ran a Google search that had BitTorrent results come up, which is like the big fear for these content owners with Google and one of their big hangups. So I, I believe Microsoft can do it competently, uh, where Google and the position that they have been with that product really would, didn't have the relationship. All right, I said terabyte. I think I meant 500 gigabyte, but it's still big enough for a DVR. Also, a bunch of people are saying, wait a minute, lifetime of a console isn't 10 years. Don't forget, folks, this doesn't mean they won't ever come out with another console for 10 years. Lifetime of the console means they're still selling it. The Xbox 360 is still going to be sold. In fact, they're teasing an announcement at E3 about the Xbox 360. The PS2 just stopped being bought by GameStop. It was the highest selling console for years after the 360 and the PS3 came out. So when I talk about lifetime, Time, I'm talking about the lifetime of the console, not the time until the next one comes out. I think that that I think we've beaten this to that. Let's move on to not such a big story, but it is our fourth big story. Uh, 
Uh, Wall Street Journal has an article about cord cutters. Now, Wall Street Journal is historically trying to poo-poo the idea of cord cutters, but they say that last year around 1% of U.S. households stopped paying for home Internet subscriptions, whereas according to consumer surveys by Lightman Research Group, just 0.4% of households canceled pay television subscriptions. So if there's a cord people are cutting, ladies and gentlemen, it's the Internet cord in favor of wireless over their cell phones or free Wi-Fi at coffee shops. I'm glad you pointed out that the Wall Street Journal has a uh, a Fox-owned uh, publication, has a history of poo-pooing on, on cord cutting. Because I, I was, something about this just felt like, uh, I don't know, like, I don't want to say hit piece, but uh, it felt like a hit piece. And uh, weirdly, like, when I read the headline, I'm like, that makes no sense. I don't believe that at all. But then I remembered, oh, yeah, I, I don't live in a world where I spend most of my waking hours at somebody else's workspace where maybe you have super fast internet and then come home and then, you know, watch real life TV. So, uh, I mean, I believe it, but, uh, but so what is, is my response. Yeah. I, I think this shows that what happens is people turn to alternative means if they're available when the economy is in a bad way. And that's why I don't think there is a cord cutting revolution going on. There's a cord shaving revolution going on. The people who are cord cutting, whether it's 0.4% or more, you can argue with those numbers, are doing so because they, it's just not a priority for them. They don't, they don't watch that much TV and they have to cut something out of their budget and this is the bottom thing. People cutting out internet... It's only 1%. It's the same thing. There are people like, all I do is a little bit of email and surfing the web and Facebook. So I can do that on my phone now. Why would I pay for this DSL connection anymore? It's not the people who are out there streaming loads of videos. So I almost feel like both those numbers are irrelevant, frankly. Yeah. I mean, listen, the, the Wall Street Journal is a business publication. They look at business numbers and they try to draw conclusions on them on uh, where the futures of these companies are going. Uh, I, I agree with you guys. I think the, the issue here is not necessarily about what choices people are making based on the habits they've had before, but rather the habits that are settling in with new consumers as they come up. And I do think that, you know, uh, I the you know, my, my six year old little brother, uh, I don't know if if he has an interest in a Wi-Fi connection uh, or a data connection on his phone. I think he looks at that as the same thing. So if he can. If he's mostly a mobile computer, then he's not going to care about having a Wi-Fi. Ninety-nine percent of people are keeping their internet connections. There Hooray. you go. Could be that. I mean, how they're watching us, right? That's awesome. Keep paying uh, even for that, phone, for God's sake. Right? You can watch us on your phone. Just saying. I mean, data cap, sure, but you're on Sprint because you don't have that much money. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Shutterstock.com. At Shutterstock.com, you'll find the perfect image for video for your next creative project. Forget watching video. You're making video. I know a lot of you actually are making video, whether it's for your website or it's a publication or an advertisement. You can choose from over 1 million high-quality stock video clips, 2D, 3D, animation, motion graphics, Clips in a bunch of different digital formats. Most come in HD. Shutterstock sources video clips, Brian, from the pros. They find really good stuff, and they vet it, too. No amateur hour shenanigans over here. We're talking high. Like, I don't even know what, I, know what I was just watching, but it was beautiful. I'm looking at time-lapse clouds. I feel like time and space are warping all around me. You don't get that with some amateur hour guy with an iPhone. And that doesn't mean they're not uploading because they have to wait to be approved. They're uploading 10,000 video clips each week. So every time you visit, you're going to find something new. Great search tools. The thing I love about Shutterstock is the search. Uh, you can drill down by category, by resolution of video, by contributor. Uh, you can save your video assets to a clip box. So if, if you see a bunch of these videos that Brian's talking about and you want to put together a pastiche, you can just put them in your clip box, access them anytime, share them with other team members. They also have a huge image library of photos, vectors, icons, infographics, graphic templates and flexible pricing you can choose between individual clips if you just need that one or if you got a bunch of stuff get a video pack you can download clips in hd or by standard definition or web formats we have found so many cool things that we we're talking about here so why don't you go try it out yourself try shutterstock today sign up for a free account it doesn't cost you anything to look no credit card needed to get an account just Start an account. Begin using Shutterstock. Imagine what your next project could be like. Find some cool video. Save some selections to the clip box. And once you need to purchase, use the offer code FRAMERATE6. And new accounts will receive 30% off any of the packages. 30% at Shutterstock.com. For 30% off new accounts, use offer code FRAMERATE6. We thank Shutterstock for their support of FRAMERATE. All right, folks, it's time to slip in 
to the slip stream. Remember old Jason Killar, Brian Brushwood? Oh, Jason Killar. It seems like just yesterday that you were still the CEO of Hulu, making brash decisions that were turning the whole world of cord cutting upside down and shaking up the people who paid your tab. I'm sorry to see you fade into the twilight, never to be seen again. Your disruptive insights, never again to show up here on frame rate. Well, actually, Brian, he has found Richard Tom. Richard Tom was the former CTO of Hulu who left before Kalar. He was succeeded by Eric Feng. Kalar and Tom have bought some office space right here in Los Angeles, California, to do a startup. Now, rumors are they're still whiteboarding. They're just hiring engineers. They don't know exactly what the product is going to be. It's probably not going to involve licensing because, frankly, Jason Kalar is probably done with fighting licensing battles for the rest of his life. But they do want to do something in your living room with entertainment and video. Uh, okay. That's a, that's a shock to my system, Tom. <laughs> it's something that we didn't see coming at all on this show. No, of course. Of course, Jason Kalar was going to leave and do this, but he's doing it now. I think that's interesting. No? That's well, I mean, absolutely. It, it does depend on what he's, he's going to do, right? You know, I mean, he's a guy who was obviously very, like Brian said, very brash, made a lot of headlines, you know, very publicly uh, spurned and ridiculed Yahoo, and they uh, were kind of circling him to be a, a possible CEO replacement before Marissa Mayer. And uh, I, I mean, I guess it's like cool that he's doing it. I, I think he can have a very interesting idea in that space. And I, I was a public doubter of Hulu on day one, and I was proven wrong uh, in hilarious fashion. So I'm excited to see what he does from here. But until he does, like, I don't know. Groovy. You mean hulurious fashion? Yes. <laughs> no, no, you don't. Uh, paid content has a report. This is also not a surprise, but one, you know, uh, as a we matter name of the this public segment, record. not a surprise hour. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, the uh, oh my gosh, the broadcast networks ABC, Fox, NBC, Al Britain Communications, and Telemundo have asked the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia to issue an injunction to stop the service known as Aereo Killer from streaming their shows. Aereo Killer is Alki David, the guy who does film on. It's sort of a jibe at Barry Diller, and it does the same sort of thing without geo restrictions. Barry Diller is very good about saying, "Look, we're only going to show New York State." to people in New York because we are just an extension cord for antenna. Whereas Alki David says, I don't know, you want to watch Los Angeles and you, uh, stations and you live in New York? We don't care. We're going to let you do that. And what's happening is the station, the studios are going after Alki David to make precedents that they could then later use against Barry Diller's Aereo. Yeah, doesn't it seem like uh, Alki's David de de decision to to not play by the rules? Like the the whole the whole reason Aereo uh, seemed to launch was to test the waters of this and do everything exactly by the letter of the law by by flagrantly you know defying the letter of the law. Here, I I feel like this Aereo killer is doing a disservice to people who want to see transformations in the way in the way our our legal framework is for watching what you want when you want it. Well, yeah, but, I, I, I don't but, think any any of these guys on either side of this issue like Alki David. He's totally a, a renegade. He's he's a rebel in the business. And, and let's just say a lot of the services for which we love very very dearly operated with you know a a maybe a, a guarded position that kind of disregarded certain laws. But I mean, YouTube started as a place to watch pirated content. It has blossomed into an ecosystem beyond that, but it started as a repository for things that other people owned in an era before we really understood what that meant. Uh, I think the fact that he's doing this is unsurprising, but this ain't Barry Diller's first rodeo. He is he is going to... Yeah, but he's also, he's he's in it to make a splash not to make a precedent, Barry Diller very carefully prepared his legal team for the battles when they launched Aereo. And yeah. Aereo Killer is undermining those cases in ways that YouTube didn't have like Daily Motion get sued and undermine the case for YouTube, right? So right. Well, and keep in mind also, landscape. like, like, don't forget that legal precedent matters. What the last judge said before you get to your case uh, makes a difference. And so uh, in in... In a way, the order of the mini bosses that they're going to fight will determine how this thing turns out. And if you have a bunch of mini bosses that that all build this precedent of this whole scheme is illegal, then it's going to damage Ario's case, and I believe you know harm the consumer's free choice in the end. 
And Aereo Killer has an injunction against it in the West Coast District, including California, which means it's going to be harder for Barry Diller to start Aereo out here. If if they get an injunction against Aereo Killer in D.C., there's another another district that becomes more difficult. So it really does put a roadblock in his way. Let's move on to tube tops. At D Dive into Media, it was a D Dive into Media. No, it was D Eleven uh, last week. Fanhattan became Fan TV and unveiled an Eve Bahar designed set top box. Now this is interesting. We don't know when it's coming or what the price is going to be, but it has three ports on the back: power port, Ethernet port, HDMI. Yet they say it is going to bring you your cable television. So far from being what Google One or what Google TV and Xbox One are, which is the same thing, this is saying we're placing all of our bets on the fact that we're going to strike deals with cable companies to deliver over Ethernet somehow. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean directly over the Internet. It could be IPTV through the cable that's just then adapted to Ethernet for this box. But they're like, we're not doing HDMI pass-through. We are going to be your cable box and allow you to watch Netflix and Hulu, et cetera, and have an easier-to-use navigation system. There's no buttons on the remote. You just swipe back and forth, and then there's an on-screen keyboard. Uh, yeah, you do get to see a little bit of the the interface on there. Uh, now we're seeing it on on iPad right here, but but they also show some screen grabs from the full screen experience. I like this whole idea of a buttonless remote, uh, but I don't know. It, it mentions an on screen keyboard, which seems like a pain in the ass. Um, uh, did we see any of the overlay stuff, like a sidebar of information? Yeah, the idea is that you'll have your favorite channels uh, up there, and then you'll have related programming. If you, if you watch something, you'll say, oh, you might like this. You can search for things directly, but it's trying to say, you don't know what channel anything is on anymore. You know what you want to watch. So we're going to make it easy to find the things you watch all the time, and then you just do quick searches for the things that are new and find them no matter where they are, whether they're at Netflix or Hulu or Vudu or on your broadcast network work we're going to be agnostic and do it all uh, i do very much uh delight the fact that uh in their stand-in for your cable provider they are uh they show the logo for cable town which was the 30 rock stand-in uh for comcast uh <laughs> yeah, i uh, i think this is great but have any deals yet is what that means yes it means that they're trying to make a joke because they don't actually have anybody uh with, with their name on the dotted line uh but brian the the uh the interface that they have there is really just a physical version of what a lot of the app experiences for remotes are with like Roku or Apple TV. Yes. Yes. Well, I mean, it's just, it, it's like, um, uh, you know, by and large, I love using my Xbox remote in order to interface with Netflix, but then there's always that moment you want to search for a single thing and you have to go through all the letters and all that stuff. And, and so likewise, I just wonder how that's going to be with any kind of on-screen cave. Uh, like I would rather, this is a case where the Xbox one has the advantage in that they're like, Hey, you're looking for a thing. Just say it, and and we'll find it for you. I do think that that's a substantial UI advantage that it's going to have. But again, you know, I'm going to reserve judgment this until you actually see the thing. Price point, price point, price point. That's going to be the big yeah. issue with this. Makes a big difference. Yeah, price absolutely. point and service, right? If I can get this thing for ninety nine dollars and get my local cable company, yeah, it's pretty compelling. If it's two hundred dollars and I can't, yeah, forget it. Yeah. Uh, Meanwhile, Roku is still probably the most popular way to do this kind of stuff. And they just got $60 million in investment uh, from some big names. All Things D claims that one of them is Fidelity, uh, the financial company. They, the other one is Hearst Corp. We know that one for sure. And they're going to use this to try to expand the service. And what, what was interesting about this All Things D, or, or sorry, this Verge article, is they say they're going to try to get that service into televisions, Brian, rather than being the separate box. And I know that that's something we've talked a lot about. Like pe people don't seem to want that. They they want to have the box. Well, and don't we, was it Roku that had the little stick thing that you could just stick yeah, right in? Yeah, they're still doing the stick. That's right. Yeah. I mean, it's virtually, it's virtually in the television right now. Now, this is a curious case because traditionally early positioning is what matters in order to become a dominant force. But the more I'm watching Roku, this is stay alive money for Roku, not dominate the market money. And uh, as we're seeing stuff that, you know, first with Google, with Google TV, we've had stories of Intel getting into this space. Of course, Xbox One leads off with it. I mean, I, I kind of feel like Roku's having the squeeze put on them right now. And I don't know how long staying alive is going to really help them. They don't have any major exclusives that, that fire me up. I mean, is there a place for Roku five, ten years from now? Oh, I think I, I think Roku has is, is carved a, a very, very excellent niche for themselves. I mean, if you look at Xbox, Xbox One is going to be, they are trying to entice people 
to, to be able to buy it, but that price point is very, very high. If you don't play video games and you don't have a huge lore, like some sort of massive original programming, like like if, if, if let's say my crazy NFL thing comes through, then that's a lot to pay for something that is already served expertly well by either an Apple TV or a Roku. I think, you know, Roku has really carved uh, out a niche for being able to uh, take your, uh, or have your Amazon, uh, your Amazon Prime instant video, uh, to have your HBO Go in many cases, unless you have Comcast. In that case, you can't have it. Just so in case you want to buy a Roku and you have Comcast HBO, don't, you'll be upset like I was and am. Um, well, DirecTV isn't available on Roku's HBO Go either. It's just stupid. Yeah, it's, it's only uh, Time Warner. And don't just think you can have your friend send you his Time Warner thing and just have it set up. Not that easy, my friends. It's not. No. That's, and so that is why we believe uh, Roku is making the right decision to uh, to get integrated with televisions. Because if you're going to go for the low end, essentially, once it becomes integrated with televisions, you get the Roku experience and the perceived price point becomes zero. It, com- it becomes factored into the television purchase. And to be honest, I do think that's a place that Roku could survive for a very long time. And uh, especially when, by and large, people don't like the built-in integrated experience with uh, streaming directly to their television if they had a branded experience with with Roku, I think that could work out. Well, it also it also yeah. kind of changes the business model because you go from a consumer company to a company that's dealing with manufacturers to build in your technology, which is a sure. different way of making money. Yes, I, I agree with everything both of you said. So let's move on to film film. Amazon greenlighted five of the pilots they had put up on uh, the uh, on the website for people to vote on. Alpha House, the political comedy written by Gary Trudeau, starring John Goodman. Uh, Betas, the comedy about Silicon Valley, are the two non-kids show. Uh, and then Anne Bots, about robots, Creative Galaxy, the animated art adventure series, and Tumbleleaf, a kids show about a small blue fox named Fig, all got the green light. Uh, and Zombieland so- did not. What, yeah, what is surprising is is less what uh, what made the cut, but what didn't make the cut. Now, in this case, you you do have John Goodman, who's who's a, a big Hollywood name associated with Alpha House, but I believe all these other ones don't have very well names, uh, very well known names associated with them, nor do they have established properties behind them. Whereas Zombieland and The Onion, uh, I forget what The Onion show was called, but I actually watched The Onion pilot and it was pretty good, but uh, uh, but nothing that I was totally freaked out about. If this was television. They would have factored in the value of those names, but instead, by getting the raw da- data, by actually watching what people watch to completion, and by finding out uh, probably more directly which ones they like, they were able to make a more educated decision in a more efficient uh, method than you would get with a traditional piloting process. Well, we now, don't think, know that, though. I mean, like, I mean they I, made it I different. Mean, I think so. I mean, like, but like, there are series that are. I mean, the Beverly Hills Cop was uh, thought to be a slam dunk pilot for CBS this year. And that didn't go through. That had Eddie Murphy on it. Eddie Murphy doing television. So, like, I don't know if it's, if necessarily we, it, this was a more open piloting process, certainly. I mean, before that, we were only able to kind of read the tea leaves based on what Hollywood trade uh, magazines and websites kind of tell us. But uh, I think it was very interesting to see the Zombieland creators get super butthurt on Twitter and start uh, blaming the fans for killing it. Well, it's a, it's a much more public disapproval of your pilot uh, in this case when it's put up on the web and then announced and everybody knew what the slate was that was being considered. I, I do think really interesting is what's going on with the killing from AMC. It's beginning season three and in the UK and Ireland, you can watch it on Netflix the day after it airs in the US. Uh, it was a previously, I think, available on Channel 4 in the UK, but it won't be returning to Channel 4. And according to the CNET article, they weren't going to get renewed on AMC in the US until they struck this deal with Netflix to get money from Netflix, which allowed them to renew it on AMC. Well, and we heard about this. So wasn't this the case with Friday Night Lights? Like Absolutely. they weren't going to be renewed and then they got cash from Netflix? Uh, and effectively, uh, damages even though. As well. Even though they're not calling it this, effectively, Netflix has an exclusive. All of a sudden, this is a Netflix exclusive, just not labeled as such, right? In yeah, those, in those I, markets? I don't remember Friday Night Lights getting any special treatment on Netflix originally. It was more of a, no. well, we want to have it after the season is done. No, no, no. This no that, was, that was Direct TV. The Friday Night Lights deal was with Direct, was Direct TV. Direct TV, not Netflix. Okay, yeah, Direct TV paid to basically uh, co finance the show with the idea that Direct TV would, would get. Uh, on their Channel 101, the first run of Friday Night Lights, 
and then uh, an, a slightly edited down version would run like three months later or four and months later on NBC. still U.S. only. What's interesting about this is Netflix essentially got the rights, like you're saying, Brian, mm -hmm. in the U.K. and Ireland away from a broadcast network and, was, and because of that was able to have enough money coming in to keep the series alive. And of how course, interesting well, is it that... Whether that's a good thing or not is up for debate. That yeah, the sure. Is but, still going. Uh, yes, well, I mean, that, that's fine. But, but what's interesting is I suspect had this exact same scenario happen uh, two or three years ago, we would have seen press releases from Netflix crowing about how we have an exclusive. But now, given the fact that they're just in a fundamentally different position than they were just one year ago... It's it's not even it's not even a press, really a press release about them having an exclusive at all. It's like uh, anyway. So if you're in these areas, well, probably, you can watch they'll, it the day they'll after. market it that way in the UK and Ireland for sure. I, I, sure I, they'll sure. make a big deal. But you're right. It's it's not the only exclusive they have. So it's not like the biggest news for them in the world. They've got Arrested Development. They've they've got Orange is the New Black coming out. They you know they've got 16 new shows coming next year or whatever. Minor note here: uh, BuzzFeed the Meme-tastic website is partnering up with CNN to create a YouTube channel called CNN BuzzFeed, where they will take CNN videos, sometimes repackage them, sometimes run them whole, and then they'll also do three original videos a week that will go up into this channel that are very news-oriented. So in other words, what they're going to do is they're going to take uh, CNN st news stories, uh, hold back some number of items, and say... The three things you won't believe Obama said in his speech. <laughs> no, and then but you see, got a headline. That's what BuzzFeed's famous for because that's what brings in the traffic. But they also have these longer feature pieces. And what, what they're saying in the TechCrunch story is that this video is, is channel is a way to take that kind of content and do video versions of it. Yes. I mean, and, and, and to be fair, like this might be kind of an answer to like what Vice has been doing with HBO. That right. To take a longer form kind of offbeat stuff that would be newsworthy or interesting but not necessarily television ready and uh, find a home for it with a bigger production budget yeah it's, it's buzzfeed getting into partnership with somebody who can give them a little juice and possibly be able to make some better stuff uh so it'll be interesting to keep an eye on it's a little weird they only have one video up right now of the as you say, Brian, top 10 greatest rescue moments. Okay, was it really? I didn't even yeah. know. That's so amazing. They totally start in that <laughs> direction uh, to begin with, which, again, that's what they do on the website, so it's no surprise there. I, I would like to point everybody that uh, the second video is going to be the top 10 grumpy cat macros that explain why this will be a failure. <laughs> uh, and speaking of, well, it's not a failure, but it's a departure. Matt Smith announced he will be leaving Doctor Who after the Christmas special. Uh, that will be his last appearance as the doctor, Justin, uh, are, well, I, I'm curious before I say my feelings, how you feel, because I know you're a big Doctor Who fan like I am. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, and I think it was pointed out to me actually by Patrick Delahenty here uh, at Twit that that means we only get two more episodes with Matt Smith. We get the 50th anniversary, we get the Christmas special because there's not going to be a half season in between it like there was this year. Uh, I, I mean, to be honest, I believe that I hope that the new Doctor will kind of give a new coat of paint on this series. I kind of feel like Stephen Moffat, who took over the show when Matt Smith was introduced as the Doctor, kind of fell in love with the quirky nature of, of Smith as an actor. And although I think that's great, it's very engrossing, it has, to me, grown a little stale. I, I would like to see a new Doctor bring a new take on the tone of the show, but I'm sad to see Smith go. I think his first season with Amy Pond was uh, among the, the best that the Revive show has done. And uh, he's certainly a beloved uh, figure, and, you know, I wish him the best. Now, what, uh, in the realm of, you know, since we love to speculate wildly here, in the realm of what would be an acceptable twist for them to do for the next Doctor, what's acceptable and not acceptable? Would you accept, like, a woman Doctor? Would that just yeah, be of course. too no, that's far a, out of canon? No. The past, when David Tennant got regenerated, that was all the talk. Is it going to be a woman? Is it going to be uh, African or, or is it gonna Indian? Be a, what about an American Doctor? Would you tolerate an American Rooker. Doctor? Anybody. Rooker for the Doctor. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> Listen, they got Superman, they got Batman, they got Spider-Man. Time to give one back, Brittos. <laughs> that, I've heard all of these rumors in the wake of the Matt Smith news. It's going to be a woman. It's going to be an African. It's going to be an American. Uh, who knows which way they're going to go with it. I have to say, though, when David Tennant left, I was sad and I was nervous and I was worried about who was going to be the next doctor. As much as I like Matt Smith, this time I'm excited. I'm actually looking forward like, 
Ooh, what are they going to do? Who's it going to be? Well, they've got they, a good track record now. You know, we've seen we've seen the departure and we've seen something new and fresh come in. And it does kind sure. of yeah, I agree with Justin. You know, there's a reason that, uh, you know, my daughter and I went back and watched so many of the old Matt Smith episodes. I say old, meaning, you know, last year uh, on on uh, Netflix. But now we are at that point where it's like this new season's out. And it's like I've only watched half of the episodes just because they do sort of, sort of all feel the same right now. Uh, I think I, that's Mr. the rebound doctor. You don't not like him, but you're ready to fall in love again. There you I, go. I don't know. I mean, besides the the, the personal me. relationships me. we've all had with uh, with with uh, the various doctors, I do think that you know Matt Smith again. That first beginning with him crash landing on Amy Pond's lawn and ending uh, with however that series ends, I just realized I was about to spoil. Uh, it was. Top to bottom, really amazing. I think The Doctor's Wife is among the best episodes that has ever been done on, on the Revive series. Uh, I, I will I will definitely miss him. But I'll say this. Number one, I don't necessarily... I mean, like, if, if they have a great idea for a woman doctor, uh, I think that's 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 cool. I would like to see that. But I, I, I think when you have all of time and space to play with, keeping the dynamic that has been uh, the signature of the Doctor Who franchise being a white early 30s to late 30s doctor and a young British woman uh, is is fine. You know, it's fine to continue with that dynamic Racist. and then wrap everything else that's ever happened or will happen in the universe around it. You have no shortage of story ideas. Racist. I'm also racist. All right, let's move. I, I heard it both times, Tom. Let's, let's move forward and check in on the movie draft. Yeah, I want to keep this short. Not because I sucked this week with After Earth, but I really want to get to what we're watching because we have a lot to talk about there. Uh, After Earth, huge disappointment, may have torpedoed my season in the summer movie draft. Undergrossed, Now You See Me, which is apparently a fantastic movie. Yeah, uh, man. Uh, well, And, and uh, I, I don't know anything about the quality of Now You See Me, but certainly, the I mean, it, it definitely overrepresented. And I'm so glad that I fought to keep it in the draft since it ended up outperforming After Earth. It gave us an opportunity for a real upset. Well, uh, uh, now you see me and you can read. I actually broke this down on iTricks.com today. Uh, you uh, Now you see me overgrossed what it was supposed to. It was supposed to gross about 19 to 20. Wound up grossing about 27. It is the highest grossing. 28.5. Yeah, 28.5. Sorry. Uh, it wound up. Uh, it will likely gross more, definitely, than every magic movie that has be been released recently, except the Prestige, which was uh, I think fifty-three million, and it has a good shot to overtake that. So uh, a huge bargain in the draft. It didn't really go for all that much, but Tom, oh my God, we got to dwell on this. Like M Night is box office poison. I mean, I don't know what his next movie is going to be because he apparently keeps getting chances. But like it, an M Night Shyamalan movie. With any plot, with any actor, what does it go for in the next draft? Because I can't see paying more than $2 for it. The internship comes out this weekend. Oh, so you nice. scumbag. <laughs> well, I got nothing to say. I'm not going to disagree with you. You're absolutely right. Uh, Cargill <laughs> bid me up, I, and I lost I lost the face-off. You know? It wasn't like I thought it was going to do that well either. But you know, I'll say this. Better. Listen, here's Million. the deal. He keeps putting out stinkers and stinkers and stinkers and stinkers. And then his last movie is amazing. What a twist for M. Night Shyamalan's career. <laughs> uh, but the internship comes out this weekend. That's Sarah Lane's movie. And she's got The Great Gatsby. And now you see me. So she's coming on strong, Brian Brushwood. She's got you in her sights. No, she's done very well. Sarah is always a shrewd player. She only paid $10 for Now You See Me, uh, which outperformed what you paid $33 for. Again, not to rub it in, but it, that's just good playing on, on Sarah's part. Uh, let's it in. On I, I nothing to say. It was, I was a messed up choice, and I knew it was a messed up choice. I, I kind of hoped that the Will Smith thing might make it not be a horrible choice, but it ended up being a horrible choice. What are you going to do? No, Tom, danger is real. Fear is a choice. <laughs> Jaden is real. Fear is <laughs> Uh, I'll tell you uh, real is what we're watching. Let's move on to what we're watching. What we're watching. So, Brian, you've been watching anything good? Uh, yeah, you know what? Like, uh, like it was a homework assignment I was cramming last minute for. I finally watched the last episode of Arrested Development today, and of course, Game of Thrones. Um, Game of Thrones. I think we all agree we'll spend most of. We'll may mostly save for I think the we'll spoiler save zone. All of it for the spoiler zone. Okay. Uh, suffice to say, I think we all enjoyed the episode. Mm -hmm. Sure. Is that mm -hmm. yes. too soft of a word for it? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So, <laughs> All right. Arrested uh, so, so, Development. Uh, we'll save some for the spoiler zone, but uh, I totally agree with you, Brian, where those first two episodes, and I've heard a lot of other people say this, really hard to get into. I was worried, like, I don't know if this is any good, but the way they constructed it, you had to slog through two or three, and it was about the fourth episode for me. I think the third episode was funny for the first time, and then the fourth episode is when it really started to click. Wait, was here's Job's what's amazing. Episode. It was... It was a, and Justin said this earlier, it's the densest comedy ever written, and I do agree with that. It also was presented in a way that that could not, I think, have possibly worked in anything except for the release all at once format. It's as though, it's as though it was a novel written in disjointed short stories that were meant to be confused. It was a little bit like the Dark Tower. You know, people really dislike the gunslinger because so little of it makes sense and you're just left with all these questions like, what did I just well, I've read? Re I've read that they did that on purpose. They said, yeah. we have the ability to have everybody watch them all at once. Let's try. Let's try something. Although now, Hurwitz said specifically, don't watch it all at once, that you should watch it. No, he said space. watch it all at once. He said watch it in order, though. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. originally they had said you might be able to watch them out of order and then he backtracked and was like, don't watch them out of order. That's a bad idea. Well, I I'll say this. Uh, there, I, I, me and Brian have had long conversations about whether or not the Netflix release schedule uh, strategy is something that is good or bad. I have very much come around to Brian's position uh, that, and specifically with this release, I agree. If they had released this week by week, you would have had a month of talking about the death and and the how Arrested Development was the most the biggest hype and disappointment that has ever happened to television. Uh, it would have been an absolute disaster because. Three episodes in, I'm like, this is kind of embarrassing. Like, I really am just like, I don't want to watch anymore because I'm sort of sad that this exists. Now, the thing about Arrested Development is what Brian said, super dense. But also, it is weighed under by the fact that an ensemble show has characters that some of them you want to spend a lot of time with. Some of them you don't want to spend a lot of time with. And they are very much stretched in this new season. I think among them, Lindsay and George Sr., uh, their episodes seem way pulled but uh, other than that when it gets clicking it gets clicking and I, I gotta say i love it i absolutely was i'm, I'm head over heels for it it seemed now, like it you... was a matter of casting they couldn't get buster because he was on veep they had a harder time getting job because he's on like two other series um uh, uh i'm sorry i'm bl blanket on job all night he was on will arnett time. Will Arnett, thanks. Uh, and so, yeah, it was a little bit more unbalanced than maybe it could have been if they had everybody on at the same time. Well, and that's the other thing. Like, realize what a remarkable feat of engineering, if nothing else. Uh, now, And yes, I will be the first to admit, uh, much like I love Primer, but, the, but it's a flawed movie that makes no sense at the end. Uh, this is a flawed comedy that starts off so rocky that you almost, I, 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 I almost hesitate to tell people no definitely go for it now if you are somebody who loves arrested development then and and you are going to insist on going all the way through then yes you'll be extraordinarily satisfied with how it all ends but realize that you're not looking at a set narrative what you're looking at is a patchwork quilt a collage of all these vignettes that overlap each other and they all come to tell a story that that once you pull out to a bird's eye view satellite view you will get pretty much the whole picture uh and along the way there are brief moments of remarkable brilliance and you know very self-aware moments like uh like when uh uh you know ron howard says uh you know and before you rewind it you know or like ron howard at one point says oh, don't yeah. bother rewinding you'll just end up halfway into the maybe episode like th those little moments when he's clearly talking to people who are watching it on netflix are truly truly brilliant so I, I want to give it a, a a slightly less enthusiastic thumbs up than justin only because uh, it, it really, I think, suffered from a lack. There were so many scenes that would have made it better if they could have gotten all the characters in the same place at the same time. But instead, I believe in the entire series, there's only one scene where everyone's in the room at the same time. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and they keep going was, back to that one. It was two days on set that they had everybody, and it was all the scenes that take place in uh, the apartment, in uh, the, the mom and dad's apartment, whose name I'm forgetting. But uh, green screen is certainly a hindrance, but the question is, do we deal with the green screen scenes or do we not have new Arrested Developments? And I think we would I, all... I, You know, I don't know if they went away or if I just started enjoying the show enough not to mind them. But it was only in the first few episodes that I really noticed the bad compositing. Where I'm like, ooh, that, that didn't really play very well. Oh, no, I, that, I noticed them. I, I mean, it's just because whenever they go to like shot, reverse shot of like a character, it almost felt like, like a Final Fantasy fight. 
where like two characters wandered in and it's like begin dialogue like I'm talking now I'm talking now I'm talking uh it was uh, it, I, I don't know I mean like it was just it had to be that way for it to exist anything else Brian that you've been watching besides the rest of development uh, you no mention? man uh I made that uh, made that my big project and of course Game of Thrones uh yeah li- oh and and I should I should tell you that I, I I guess it's been 2 weeks I've started late night uh, going back and rewatching old episodes of the shield to see if it stands up and I'm I'm surprised at how well it does stand up now nice. the story starts off so much smaller than it ends it's weird to watch characters from the first season like be scared given what you see they're capable of in later seasons. But uh, but it's all free right now on Amazon Prime. If you have Amazon Prime, I believe it's free uh, with commercials on Hulu. So uh, if you haven't seen The Shield and if you're you're waiting on Breaking Bad, it's the same. It's the exact same story in reverse. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, the uh, Venture Brothers uh, season premiere, I absolutely loved it. Thought it was great. I've been catching up on Warehouse 13. I'm getting close uh, to the uh, to the end, and I know they're getting close to the finale, so I'm hoping to catch up by the time the finale comes. Orphan Black season finale was fantastic. Absolutely loved uh, that series. I, every time I thought I knew where they were going, they would they would change it up, uh, even right in the final episode. So good stuff there. Uh, Justin, real quick before we get to feedback, anything else that you've been watching you want to add? Uh, no, it was really just rest of development and and uh, Thrones. All right, let's. Go to feedback. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Flame Radio. Yeah. Feedback from Chris Baranato on Twitter at Schwood. Good review of Star Trek Into Darkness on Frame Rate, but where's the line between homage and copying? Wife and I disagreed on this. So I thought this was an interesting question, especially on this this particular movie, because it can't be an homage or copying if it takes place in the same universe, in the same timeline, where you would definitely expect to see echoes of the same experiences that shaped people before. So in, in many ways, it was like it was like the time frame of Space Seed, but the fighting of Wrath the Khan. And uh, so, so in many ways, I don't think, I think that's a very good question that I don't think necessarily applies to Into Darkness. Would you agree with that, Tom? Well, I think it's engineered to be both and neither, right? Yes, this is yes, Paramount yes. making the show. This isn't somebody else going like, I'm making an homage to Star Trek. No, you're not. You're just ripping them off. It's in the it's in the official canon. So yes. it is an homage because they are t- tipping their hat to the original characters, the original actors who played this. Uh, and yet it is also copying because they are literally using the same characters. But like you said, Brian, it's also neither because they've rebooted it and they've given an explanation saying... This is going to be similar, but it is different because we're in an alternate universe. Well, all right, here's what it is. If you like it, it's an homage. If you don't like it, it's copying. In the same bing, way bing, that when bing. you have slow-paced movies, when you like them, they're deliberately paced. When you don't like them, they're boring. It's just That's different funny. ways of assigning our own value to different things. And speaking of which, uh, one of the questions I asked last week was I said, uh, you know, for somebody who hasn't experienced both movies, we wanted to get a fresh perspective on whether Wrath of Khan was better or Into Darkness was better. Uh, By and large, most of the feedback was very predictable. If you had seen both, if you had seen Star Trek Wrath of Khan before, you tended to like that one better than Into Darkness a uh, few people agreed with my position. I'm never quite getting swept up into the, the story. But Nick had an interesting response. He said, i uh, been a fan of the Star Trek set in the 24th century since I was a kid. I've never liked the original series. And as, and as such, I've never seen Star Trek II Wrath of Khan. I have no nostalgia for Kirk era Star Trek. I did, however, like the first J.J. Abrams Star Trek. So after seeing it Into Darkness, he went and got Wrath of Khan. He says, it was nice to see where many of the... Uh, oh, he says, after watching it last night, I really feel that Into Darkness is the better of the two movies. It was nice to see where many of the concepts from the two Abrams films come from, like the Kobayashi Maru and the Centurion Slug, but I feel like Wrath of Khan takes itself too seriously when it's really just a campy 80s movie based on a campy 60s TV show. By the way, them's fighting words. Into Darkness, on the other hand, I feel like broke up the tension between the silliness, giving the audience a chance to relax and catch their breath. Uh, A little spoiler alert territory here. Uh, 30-year-old spoiler. I knew going into Rathacon that Spock dies. That was spoiled for me years what? ago. <laughs> but I feel that it's fairly obvious they're just going to go back to Regulus 1 and uh, uh, a regular one and pick him up after the magic planet does its thing. 
it, just as obvious as Khan's blood bringing Kirk back from the dead into darkness. Finally, whoa, I feel whoa, like spoiler. the infight into darkness is better than the submarine battle in Wrath of Khan. It's just more satisfying to see, Sp- <laughs> to see Spock beat the hell out of Khan than for Khan to commit suicide in the hope of killing Kirk in the process. Man, I, I think it just boils down to whatever you see first, you always think is better. I think well, that's true. Because frankly, that submarine-like battle, to me, is one of the best moments in science fiction ever. But easily. I also saw it first. Well, right? but also, so- I mean, like... I- this seems like a very odd thing to say I like this and not this because Into Darkness is built on top of Wrath of Khan. But I mean, not the way he saw them. But okay, but but I mean it is it was created very deliberately because we have a puzzle piece that fits into it, which I don't want to go into detail. But he saw into darkness first. So whether it was intended that way or reality that way, he saw into darkness. So in no, his mind and that's fine, but that's like, that's, like that's, I like hamburgers, not hot dogs, because I had hamburgers before hot dogs. I just don't know why this is an argument. Like, it just, it, 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 it it's not cause, like... Because Brian asked, that's why. It, well, it's yeah, not Brian, like... It's, it's it, not even an argument. It's, it's, a matter of, it's a matter of we all recognize that we have this bias that whatever we see first, we tend to like better. And so I was hoping somebody outside of the same bias that you and me and Tom share could maybe give a little more neutral. But unfortunately, most of them experienced it the same way we did. Just this one guy saw it in reverse, and he did what you would expect, which is the one he saw first is the one he likes better. Now, I will Finally, say that- a quick note from Anthony, who uh, pointed out that the expiration dates on the queue still exist in Netflix. So even though the expiration dates have been removed from the API, like we talked about last show, if you have something in your queue, you can still see when it's going to expire. So you know whether you want to move it up in your By queue. By the way, for the record, since we were talking Star Trek, I was just like, what does Q have to do with any of this? What are you talking about? <laughs> he wasn't even in this episode. <laughs> that is it for this episode of Frame Rate. Justin Robert Young, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, man. It's always a pleasure to be on here. I got, I got the call last night from Brian that was like, hey, listen, uh, rest of development, Game of Thrones. We're going to need to call you in. And I said, I'll be there, buddy. I'm coming <laughs> up. Bring in the lefty. Or yes. are, you, are you a righty? I don't know. Anyway, uh, where should people find you, Justin? Uh, on Twitter. Justin R. Young on Twitter. NSFW show I do with Brian. And FSL Tonight just begun with me and Tom. Uh, episode zero is up now. A preview to the season. If you listen to it and you have no idea what we're talking about, stop listening to it. If you listen to it and you're delighted by what you hear, then you will be very delighted by what you hear afterwards. You can find us on the web, twit.tv slash FR. We're live every Monday at 3.30 p.m. Pacific. 6 30 p.m. Eastern Time, and you can email us framerate at twit.tv. If you want to be spoiled, stick around the spoiler zone. Otherwise, we'll see you next time. So, Brian Brushwood, I think we should talk about uh, the Arrested Development spoilers first okay. so that people don't have to try to fast forward through the Game of Thrones stuff if they hadn't seen Game of Thrones. It's easier. Yes, to, yes. I, yes. I, Good I, call. I feel like that's a less risky thing. Uh, um, I, I don't even know how much there is to spoil. To yeah. yeah, exactly. I, 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 I don't know how much there is to spoil in Arrested Development. Um, we, we talked about like the, the weird choppiness of experiencing it. But, I mean, I guess... Uh, yes, definitely watch it. Um, I feel like... Well, the guest I stars, feel- I feel like, I mean, like, we, we can talk about the guest stars, because those are things that, like, are, are fun when they pop up and everything, and... and Dude, I'll tell people- you what, just seeing, I don't know why, but just seeing Ron Howard, like, be so awesome, Ron Howard, playing himself, somehow made me okay with the... Well, it, number one, it made me okay with the idea, again, of him doing, helming the Dark Tower series, and it made it okay for me to see it as a Netflix original. Like you I know, and what a weird thing for me to think of. That is very very Howard, odd. That that I was the, the first Howard thought you bits had. Were some of the less effective bits. I felt like they they came off a little forced. At least the early ones. I I got used to it later, and especially when he ran into uh uh um, Michael Michael in the restaurant. I thought that was like gold, and I think the idea of his daughter was gold. But the first yeah. couple meetings he had, I'm like, oh, this just feels like they wanted to put Ron in, into the script. I'll tell you what. For me, among my favorite scenes of the entire rebooted series was John Krasinski as Jerry Bruckheimer, uh, Jerry Bruckheimer's uh, uh, 
secretary or whatever taking the pitch who's like, listen, this isn't charring my tree. And to be honest, I don't think Jerry's going to come out of the ship for this one. <laughs> yes, yes. That was, yeah, no, uh, that, that was a- there were some really good inside bits, especially for fans of the show. Um, I, I don't know if you could make any sense of it, actually. Maybe a little bit if you hadn't watched the other seasons. Uh, no. a, bunch, a bunch of good magic jokes, though, Bri. Oh, my God. It was so brutal on magic. And, uh, and again, how great was the, uh, the episode with Job and Tony Wonder? Like, that whole sequence was utterly masterful from beginning to end. Uh, and then uh, Job going through the tricks that were ruined in the ocean. The, you know, uh, dove, what was it? Dove to mouse, mouse to dove. And then uh, Tobias is, I forget what, what his combination was. He's like, no, was, I, that's impossible. I want, I want well, the, to know and the, so badly who's the one writer on Arrested Development who just who just got his butt hurt by magicians because it's like, there's some stuff like this time more than ever. It was just sort of just vindictive towards magic. Like the, the moment when it just cuts over to the newsman saying just randomly, uh, the survey is in your least favorite form of entertainment, still magicians. And yeah. then just moves on to something else. Uh, I wanted to, I, I wanted to, when you mentioned the dove, uh, I thought that was an example of it working really well to plop things in early that are unexplained or seem uh, irrelevant that then turn into something that seems very relevant and then turns into something that seemed, that is entirely different than what you expected, which is that weaving story when it worked the best, right? When we see the dove in the freezer, we think immediately bar. like, oh, right, that's Job. It's got to be. Uh, well, and, and also keep in mind, like, uh, it had an ability to, it was those third and fourth punches that you would get out of the same scene, realizing that, like, the first time you're like, oh, he was there too. Now I get it. I saw it from the other side. That was clever. But then they go back again. You're like, oh, shut up. That was at the same time as this was happening. And then the fourth time, like, wait, that car that got caught off was the guy who, I mean, it was, it was, it was just in that regard, like, that was such a comedic achievement that it just makes me want to instantly forgive all of the choppiness for getting, well, when but it, here's the thing. When it got started. It's like, if you watch the first three episodes and you're like, this is really weird and awkward, like they're telling setups but no punchlines, they are! That's exactly what's happening. That is exactly but, right. But the, but the problem was receiving the punchlines without any context. For example, in the first episode, is very jarring when he gets up and, and then, you know, does this little Siamese bow thing. And then, and then you hear the Indian uh, mystic music. Uh, and then you're like, oh, that was just weird. And then, then he opens up the uh, laptop to check something and Google's blurred out for some reason. Like, like those moments, I mean, they, they're funny in those retrospect. Were, yeah, but they were just awkward me at the time, at though. The at the time, I was like, oh, okay, it's just a little accent music because he's bowing. That's funny. Oh, they're blurring out Google. That's funny. They got funnier later. They weren't laugh out loud funny the first time. They didn't bother me, though. Well, yeah, no, I, no, I agree with Brian, though. I think that they were they were dead space when I first watched it, and I'm just like, you know, I, I thought they were playing a game that I just wasn't understanding, and uh, it was good to see that they were doing it. And that, to me, listen, guys, it would have been really, 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 really easy for them to just make this a money grab, to just do another season that everybody wanted, that the cast was, like, lukewarm on getting back together on. It was really hard for them to do it, and, and to just everybody does the chicken dance and says her... And we all go home and cash a check. It, it was the fact that the ambition was there really made me love the show. And, and honestly, and- they could not have done another season on broadcast television. They needed to have the ability to binge watch because they only had three setups. They only had the boat and the, the in the apartment scene and the uh, Cinco de Cuatro scenes. With with you know with various other location scenes like like the yurts and 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 things here and there and the trial et cetera but those were the three main those were the three episodes essentially that were supersized and then chopped up into fifteen. Uh, all right, a few just random tidbits. Number one, the one character who absolutely lost nothing off his fastball was exactly as funny in the new series as he was on the old series. Barry Zuckercorn. Oh my oh, god, yeah. just amazing. This guy, yes. yeah. take to the sea. Secondarily, Absolutely. Kristen Wiig, amazing as uh, as young Lucille because she's doing a great impression of Jessica Walter. Uh, yes. Seth Rogen doing not an impression so of Seth Rogen with a wig. Yeah. <laughs> Seth Rogen was not doing an impression, which may have been the better choice than him doing a bad impression of Jeffrey Tambor, but it it was okay. It was fine. All it right, didn't two add. Questions. 
two questions I'm going to kick over to you guys. Uh, and I'm just, I'll give them both. You can take it what order, whatever order you want. Uh, number one, was the ending as satisfying as it could have been or maybe should have been? It was a very odd beat to just have father and son punch each other. And second of all, uh, for Bonnie, uh, Michael Bluth was the glue. He was the the protagonist that uh, yeah. that everybody projected into that was likable and doing the right thing. He was not that character this season. He was he was very flawed, and that was off putting and made it harder for Bonnie, especially since Michael's the one character who does make it through all of the episodes. Did did the series suffer for those the fact that the very first episode you see him wanting to go up and just randomly sleep with Lucille too? Not not for me. It didn't. For me, it was finally we didn't. I couldn't believe that Michael would never fall apart. Right. He, in fact, and he was not effective in the series. He just through a coincidence of events would always come out OK. And so this was basically saying, well, those coincidences aren't going to work in his favor as much anymore. And I liked that. I, that. I think it would have been boring if it had been the same thing again. Well, there's also there's thematically and I, I'm with Bonnie because I think that it was very noticeable to me that he was playing a very different character in this season than he had been in the past. Part of it is thematically jarring, but part of it is also you kind of have to have him be a little wackier if he's going to carry an entire episode and just not have this galaxy of insanity swirling around him constantly. Although I agree with Tom, if you watch that series, he is just as self-centered as everybody else in his family. It's just a matter of the fact that part of his self-centered kick is that he needs to be the one who's seen to be holding everybody uh, together, and that's not quite his kick in uh, this, uh, this season. But to your second point, or to your first point, rather, on the ending... This is only supposed to be the first act of, the, and, and the second and third acts will be the movie that they theoretically want to do. So the movie would focus on like the trial of Buster with the missing, you know, murder of. Oh, Lucio can, can we agree that the big robot hand, maybe one of the greatest comedic devices I've ever seen? Like, I just great. wanted to watch that. I was sad that it was introduced so late because I just wanted to watch that at all times. Yeah, yeah. no, we, we gave him a big hand. All right, we're making people squeal in pain that we haven't talked about Game of Thrones yet. So uh, waving the arms for those on the video and just saying Game of Thrones, Game of Thrones, Game of Thrones, Game of Thrones you know, over this, and over. This will be the clue for them. Go ahead and just let's just take a look at this here. I feel I've been remiss. My king has married and I owe my new queen a wedding gift. God, that's just brutal. <laughs> I take it back. Let's not look at that. <laughs> so, Game of Thrones, the Red Wedding. My experience personally was sitting there with my nephew and my wife who have not read the book and just trying to keep a blank face while I saw what I knew was coming. coming. Uh I mean, can we all agree we're all book readers for the record? We knew what was going to happen this episode. Uh, it was suffocatingly terrifying for me knowing what was going to happen. It was so expertly played that, like, I was just, my heart was in my throat waiting for it to happen. And just, like, I constantly I kept looking at the time. Yeah, me to too. I started to we doubt were the they episode. were actually going to pull it off. I was like, are they going to have enough time for this? Are they going to get to it? Well, and think about this, like as anticlimactic as uh, and I what and I'm sure this was why they did it in the book as well. But when Tyrion got married, uh, I guess, last episode. Right. Yeah. I mean, we're looking at wedding after wedding. We became familiar through the arc awkwardness of Tyrion's experience with the rituals of the wedding. So they felt comfortable to us today, which is when you had a little bit of a deviation. It started to make everyone nervous. And I was reading one review that moment. Yeah, I mean, we all knew something. We all felt something was up when the doors closed and Catelyn's looking around and, they, and the band starts playing. Did you know that the Reigns of Castamere was a specifically Lannister song? For some reason, well, yeah, I missed they, that. They mentioned this over and over in the series. Yeah. They've, been, they've been hitting you over the head with it if you've, if you've been noticing. Yeah, Cersei like, went through the whole dissertation the on the last episode. How do you know the Lannister song? Oh, I love the Reigns of Castamere because I am but, a Lannister. But specifically, like, did you reckon, because I listened, I, I always watch shows with uh, with uh, closed captioning on because I can't stand not or half hearing something because of an accent or something. And so the closed captioning clearly says, 
they begin to play Reigns of Castamere. Oh, and like, cool. I don't know that I would have recognized the song oh, just I, from the first it, bars. Yeah. As soon as they started playing it, I was like, oh, geez, really? Like, I was like, and this isn't going to make Caitlyn know that something's going on because she obviously recognizes the song. Like, why? That's well, inappropriate. And, and it's not yeah. so. just a Lannister house song. It is a song chronicling Tywin Lannister destroying a rival rebellion house that came for the Casterly Rock fortune. So it was like, this is basically like Tywin Lannister's diss track of like, you know, this is the, you know, if Tywin Lannister were Tupac, this is his hit, like his hit him up. Uh, so it, it was, uh, you know, I, I, I agree with Tom. Tom uh, I think he nailed it. They've really tried to go out of their way of explaining uh, that this is a, a very specific musical cue. And, but frankly... Uh, even if you don't get that musical cue or you don't get the captions, it's pretty clear what's going on very shortly thereafter. I mean, uh, I think the hardest moment for me in in that in that sequence was watching her tell Rob that she's pregnant. I just I was like, oh man, because we cause need because you know, because you're you're seconds away from this. The, for, what's about for, it. for for book readers, when we all know that the red wedding's coming, what we all thought was, you know, what this scene needs. More tragedy. Oh, man. We just need to layer another layer of tragedy on top. Yeah. Now, was was the was she she, she was pregnant? Was that hinted at in the book? Or I mean, it's expressly oh, stated in the television show. But uh, but man, the fact that they set that up specifically in the television show and then ever get stabbed right in the belly was just utterly brutal. I don't think Jane Westerling is who Rob is married to in the book. I do not think that she is pregnant. That was an addition for uh, the show at, and also to have the character change so it's not that, which there was, by the way, a now debunked theory that she was oh, yeah. a Lannister spy. And if that was Bruce the case... Bruce Change you're talking about. Yeah, Bruce uh, Change. R-O-O-S-E Change, if you uh, want to see and, the theory. And if that were the case, then she's really deep undercover. Yeah, uh, deep, <laughs> deep covered. Like, she's going to have to come back as a zombie uh, or a White Walker to collect. Well, I mean... And and let's I mean how spoilery are we getting? We're, we're this not. Is, this spoiling. is our dance. People, what people don't like is when we mention things from the book that we know might happen because okay. not everybody has read the book, so we want to steer clear of that. But uh, uh, yeah, they're, they're, let me what, let me let me just okay, say this. Here, yeah, go ahead. The things from the from the book that I was the most horrified to see. I don't know whether or not we will still see, which is what happens. After Catelyn dies, because once Catelyn dies, uh, she is our first person perspective in the narrative of the book. So we only hear afterward some of the brutality that happens, not only to the person of her and Rob uh, afterward, which who knows whether or not we're going to see it. But yeah, I mean, that's OK. It's it's uh, there is some desecration that happens. How about that? Yeah, but uh, you, you, know you hear about after that on TV and it's I don't think it's important for the television series. I think they could they could probably they didn't even show Ed Mirror getting killed and we know we you just know that he's done for too they're not going to let him live up right. there so there's certain things that they have to uh to move past so do we remember other anything things. else that happened in the in the episode oh Give sure like like the now end? one you know it's this constant dance about what we liked in the books and how they condensed them into these very tight scenes in the television show i thought the entire scene uh, it, where they were holed up in the in the windmill was phenomenal i think uh, brand's awakening as far as what Odor. his talents are uh, the uh, the decision to yeah yeah being a warg and and a, and a unique and special warg to boot uh, I think was great uh, I Justin and I were talking about this before like I wanted I wish that scene could have been earlier but it can't have been because because that scene was pivotal in that they outed Jon Snow as still having the heart of a crow and he bails from from the group so it had to be an awful lot all happening today um, or I guess you know this episode. Uh, but again, I thought all of that was handled extremely well, and especially that moment of hubris when Jon Snow says to his face, like, you were right all along, his eyes go white, and all of a sudden he realizes that he has to go chase down the uh, uh, the bird. Yeah. Well, one does not simply warg into Hodor. <laughs> Unless you're Bran, in which case you do. Uh, one last note, uh, the the taking of Young Kai, uh, we agree was a, uh, a, how did you put it, Justin? It was It was a little bit of a, well, we got to spend our budget somewhere, and it's not going to be on the young Kai scenes. So we'll just have some people come back and say, but, you know, yeah, I, we got the city. I was fine with that. It was sort of, yeah. uh, it was a little bit of suspense to be like, oh, that they were surrounded by bad guys, right? Did they make it? 
So I, right. I, I thought that worked as a, as a sort of like, well, since we can't show the entire sack, let's make it a moment of suspense where you don't actually know what's going to happen. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I thought it was, uh, it was well done. I liked it. I mean, I think we are now rapidly uh, entering an interesting point in the uh, Daenerys, uh, Sir, what's his name? Targaryen? Sir Bear. Selmy Barristan? No, no, Barristan no, no not, not Barristan Selmy's the old guy. Jorah? Uh, Jorah, Jorah Mormon. Mormon, yeah. yeah. Uh, him and Daria Naharis. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell you what, it's, it's just, it's, it's such an interesting point in the books. And the question is, uh, if, if we next week get another wedding or not. Right, because I, we have two more weddings that are promised. The wedding of Cersei and the wedding of Joffrey. Yeah. Uh, are we going to see those next week? And I think that we will get, we will, if I'm going to take a guess, and, and uh, this is something that is not in it's the book. It's not book spoilery. This is, this is just speculation. An absolute guess. I think we will get a resolution on, uh, at the very least, the Loras Cersei marriage. Uh, and I think next week we see Jamie come back. Yeah, I bet we see Jamie come back next week, and we see uh, a wedding. I think we the- saw Jamie in the previews, so I think you're. I think you're right. I think we'll get. I mean, obviously, if he's in the previews, he's coming back. But I think. I think I know what you mean, and yeah. I think that's good. I think Jamie comes back, and I'll tell you what. It would be if they, if they take the path of the books, and there is another wedding, uh, that or the royal wedding takes place, the Marjorie and Joffrey wedding then it would be quite a cliffhanger for the next season. Or, But then again, if they save it for next season, that would be super interesting too. So we will see. Yeah, well, and, and my nephew pointed this out. They usually uh, have the pinnacle event in the second to last, and then they have a somewhat lesser cliffhanger. It was the White Walkers marching uh, last time. Uh, I can't remember what it was in the first season. That was a little more of a cliffhanger, but it's more of a pointing to another development in a story. So I'm, I'm not sure if they would bother yeah, I, go ahead and going ahead. I don't and think doing they. I don't think they will because because I think I think we've seen the biggest twist of this whole season. I think I think this is the apex, and I think uh, I think next episode is a regrouping, and then and then something interesting in the last episode. All right, was well, that wrap it up for us on uh, Game of Thrones? Then uh, I think so. Yes. I agree. That uh, certainly wraps it up for Rob and Caitlin. And- I know. I'm just waiting for the reins of Castamere to start playing, and then we all just get arrows in the Oh, before we, before we finish up, Brian, what did you think of the, the credits song? Ah, uh, loved it. It was so disquieting. It was so... I, I wasn't going to be the one to bring it up, but if you want to make the audience squirm, that's how you do it, my friend. Dead silence, let them squirm. You don't play we some... Act, we, we started talking a little bit in the like sort of like OMG... Way and it almost felt sacrilegious to be talking at that yeah. point because I mean, there was no there was to... just just that moment of Catelyn having just and by the way something that like uh, I, I was you know something that I had forgotten about the books uh, is that and in the books it's Walder Frey's son not his wife uh, but the same interaction that you know she murders a child you know broken on all levels uh, and then just to visually see random dude McGirt just come over with all the passion of picking up a pile of trash and just slicing her neck and having her fall down was just, I mean, it was, it was just an indelible uh, moment of television. I mean, it is a crowning achievement for this story and this series. And it's actually, if you go to entertainment weekly, they have an interview with George R. R. Martin, who's basically like, uh, yeah, I know everyone hates it and me. And this has basically been my last decade of getting angry emails and letters of people furious with me about this. So I'm really pumped that now there's just yet another fresh group of people that hate my guts. Have you seen have you seen this uh this this Twitter account? Oh, uh, Red Wedding Red Tears. Red Wedding yeah. Tears. Yeah. It's people rage quitting. Good night Game of Thrones. Just ruined my life. Bye. So Game of Thrones just ruined my summer. Uh Game of Thrones. Someone in your writer staff messed up and ruined the show. Sincerely used to be a fan of Game of Thrones. <laughs> I like the uh, I like the one that said, "You know why George R. R. Martin doesn't use Twitter? Because he already killed all 140 characters." <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Well, you know, he talked about you know that that uh, 
George R. R. Martin says he did it because, uh, you know, he kills Ned Stark because he wants you to believe he is the hero and then say, this ain't that story. So if you were thinking that this was, you know, the noble Ned Stark saving the day, it ain't that story. And then when his son is there, you then think that the next logic, oh, okay, well, they killed him off, so this can be the story of this. Oh, no, it's not that either. It ain't the story of the son uh, reclaiming the throne of the father, at least this son reclaiming the throne of the father. So, And in fact, in a way, as a reader, I don't know how I would have reacted in the television series, but the death of Ned Stark was more shocking than the Red Wedding. The Red Wedding was shocking in the scope of it. In other words, they, the Which, betrayal. The Red Wedding, the red uh, wedding is, is like, I knew you were going to play that game, but I didn't think you'd go that far. Whereas right, like exactly. Ned Stark was like, whoa, buddy, I didn't know you we're were going to play that game. And you just punched me in the face. What's going on? I wonder if the bread and salt thing was lost on most people. Like they hand out the bread and the salt, and that was a cool fan moment. Uh, but they didn't explain that when you give someone bread and salt, you are basically guaranteeing their protection while you're yes, within right. the walls. Yeah. And the phrase just did the unthinkable by violating that oath, violating that protection. Well, and that's, I think, what uh, we're probably going to get a little bit more of and we saw a hint of in the next week on with Tyrion that, uh, you know, that this is not, uh, this ain't, this is dirty pool on every single level. And really that's even more of what, like, Where the Reigns of Castamere are such an interesting song because this is basically the Lannister saying, hey, when we're in power, we don't give it up. Like, this isn't, like, we don't leave things to chance. We will play, we're the dirtiest players in the game, and you will literally have to kill us to get us off this throne. There is no way that we are in any way giving anybody any kind of leeway to bubble up a rebellion. We will play dirty. And they do, and Walder Frey is the proxy for it, as is Roose Bolton. In the Game of Thrones, you win or well, you just die. You just kind of die. <laughs> Nobody wins. Awesome. All right. I guess we'll wrap it up. Uh, dude, that was, good. It was a good time. Thank you for joining us, Justin. Oh. Yeah, thanks, man. Um, I'm happy happy to do it. To talk about Game of Thrones. Woo. Just good. To do the What's... podcast you and I do on the phone with the two yeah, of us. Yeah, I want to invite everybody to uh, just imagine the podcast that me and Brian do every night after Game of Thrones where we call each other. And just do a show, and uh, we have sponsors, and it's a pretty fun time. <laughs> just imagine that anybody hears it but us. Yeah. Well, that is it for the spoiler zone, although the chat room is saying that I need to look at my wife's Twitter account, although she's sitting right there. So I guess I could just ask her what she wrote. What did you write? I retweeted, I retweeted an actress. Who just tweeted. Well, so there's what? a vine? She retweeted an actor. Oh, Aria. Oh, that's awesome. Here, let me let me throw that on here. Here's Arya. They dead. Like so dead. Like OMG dead. My mother and brother are dead. <laughs> they dead. Like so dead. Like OMG dead. My mother and brother are dead. <laughs> all right, on behalf of all of Texas, let me just say, Hello, Governor. I'm a 14-year-old girl. Don't you know? Chip <laughs> true. <laughs> all right, we're really finished this time. Thanks, everybody. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs>